Yeah, it's rolling on. Okay, cool. Uh, hi everyone, uh, I'm Terence. In case you don't know me, I joined this company in last year, January. So it's uh, close to one and a half, well, actually it's like one and a half year now. Uh, I worked on many pieces <laughs> uh, of Reactor, uh, in specific like uh, all the Pro and Runner architecture, uh, the open source Pro. Uh, and then something inside the data fabric and something for a router and uh, basically you can find my code like everywhere in the reactor. Uh, but today the talk is about a stream on fast. While it is starting, um, so stream of files. Um, okay, let me turn off the screen saver quickly. So what is stream of file? So first of all, what is a stream? Obviously there are lots of data flowing through the system. So what is a stream? So in reactor, stream is the means is the primary means for data collections, which means you can use it to ingest data into the reactor. And that's one of the way that we suggest people to, to ingest data into reactor. There are other ways, like for example, you can write a flow lab and keep pulling data from outside or like in future or support two applications that you can use all the user two applications to do that as well. But for stream it provides a very easy to use REST API uh, for any kind of actually we trying to send data uh, or what we call events into the stream and the API is kind of like individual events. So the every time you send one event uh, and then you get a response to, to know whether um, the, the event has been written correctly, like successfully or not. And then the data that you return to the stream later on will be consumed by reactor programs, uh, which is user program. Uh, as of today, uh, Flow and MapReduce can read to, can read data from stream. Okay. So for example, you can write a Flow that keeps reading data from stream. And then, like, do some processing, maybe persist it through some data set, or do whatever you want. Or you can run a map with this job, uh, like what we did in the AT&T POC, uh, that will periodically process the data and write to HBase um, using workflow uh, to trigger map with this job periodically process the data. So these are the two major uh, consumer of the data to stream. Uh, in future, we might be keep expanding that. Uh, like capability, uh, when we have like stream more integrated with data sets and other stuff as well. So the questions become so why 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 we emphasize stream on files, right? As what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, while there is a little bit of history in the older version of Reactor, which basically before Reactor 2.2, stream is implemented as um, Q on HBase. I'm not going to talk about Q today. Maybe we have another brand that we can talk about Q. Uh, but basically we use the same implementation for Spring as well. Uh, which uh, in one sentence is we store individual events as uh, individual rows in the HBase table in, in a HBase table and then the consumer by, like basically keeps scanning table as a way to consume events from the stream. 
Uh, and it's the same implementation as the queue that we use for the flowlet, uh, interflowlet uh, communication. So why on file, right? Every data that you write to like to HBase or through level DB within the, in single load, eventually they go into file. So if you look for performance, right, the more intermediate layer that you remove, the faster should it should be. I mean, in, in general, right? So. And for stream, what we think is it should be really, really fast to write and to read. And it's relatively simple because you think about what is stream. Uh, like, for example, simple log collection, right? Every uh, log data that, that uh, a web server logs, right, can be one, one event that you write to stream. So the amount would be huge and you want it to be really, really fast. But then it's kind of relatively simple because it's like a penalty kind of operations. Uh, so that's the reason why uh, we try to implement stream on file. That's the you know, performance. Uh, that's a Bulgarian. <laughs> that's a Bulgarian? Yes. It's a brand for it. So it matches with the brand for it. <laughs> anyway. So let me show you a really, really high level architecture first. Um, how does the whole thing look like? It's very simple. It's very, very simple. So you've got a bunch of clients, right? You can have like thousands of clients because they might be coming from the web server or some kind of data collection or they may be even coming from the browser directly or some kind of client directly. So it could be like hundreds of thousands of clients that are sending data to the stream simultaneously. Of course, everything goes through our router layer. <laughs> and router will basically use a discovery and route uh, I think it's random right now, or random, uh, to the stream writer. So we could have multiple instances of stream writer uh, on the back end. Uh, of course, at least you need one, but you have multiple. And each writer would, like when we receive a request, right, we, when we receive an event, we write to a file. Of course. And different writers, they write to different files, because that's how it is, right? You cannot have two processes or not even two threads that write to the same file simultaneously. Right? So they have to be on separate files. And well, in this particular picture is a, is a flowlet, right? So we have a bunch of flowlet instances uh, that belongs to one or more flows. It depends on like, how many flows you have, how many flowlet instances you have. Uh, and of course, they read from multiple files. And Kind of construct a single uh, view of the events that you get that get written to the stream, even the multiple files, and then use HBase or LevelDB in case if it is single node to persist some kind of states. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about those like states and that kind of stuff later. But this is kind of the high level architecture. It's really really simple, right? So we used to be we used to be this one write to HBase and this one read from HBase and also and then persist the state back to HBase again. That gives really high um, like, uh, pressure on the on HBase server. Uh, and in fact, like after this one, uh, uh, we see like, a lot of performance improvement in terms of like, writing and reading to stream because of this. So it's really, really simple. Okay, so, uh, so before I go into details on the writer and the reader side, I would like to show you like, how the files have been organized on the on the file system first, so that we can go into more reason why it's like that and what kind of benefits that we have with this kind of structure and file format. So the directory structure. Uh, so basically, uh, it's not really good, but it's kind of like the, a base directory for all the stream, uh, which is kind of configured in the uh, C configuration. Uh, so the top level, of course, is, a, is the name of the stream. And then next, there's something called generation. Uh, I'll explain generation a little bit later. But basically, generation is needed for uh, stream truncate. Uh, each truncate will basically increase the generation so that uh, uh, both writer and reader would not like write or read from the older generation. That's kind of for the truncate case. I'll talk about it. I'll talk about truncate later. And then the next level, next level of directory will contain information about partition. So talking about partition, 
is because stream event is always written according to the timeline, right? So you always always carry a timestamp uh, per event. So in order to be efficiently consuming, especially for map models, right? Uh, we kind of introduce a structure for a time partition. So that, for example, you can easily write a map reduce that, can, that you can specify a start time and an end time. And then when we compute the file speed, uh, when you start the map reduce job, uh, we can use this directory, uh, directory structure to help us quickly determine what files are needed and what files are not needed. Rather than you have to like, use the mapper to scan through all the files and then do the filtering during the map, uh, map phase. So in, the, in here, the partition directory is named as a partition start time. Uh, so it's basically the time stamp in seconds. And then it got, and then the uh, partition duration, which is also in number of seconds. Uh, I'll have examples on exactly how it looks like. And then under the part partition directory, there will be the actual string files. Okay? Um, so there are two types of string files. Uh, well, in general, one stream file actually contains of two physical files. Uh, one is the data file, which contains the actual event data, right? Like the whatever bytes are already to send by the user. And then there's another index file, which basically contains a timestamp to file offset pair, which the file offset is pointing back to uh, the file position inside the data file. So it is used for uh, like quickly scanning through as, or skipping through the uh, file to a particular uh, timestamp uh, or a particular offset. So we use that for uh, map reduce and also for flowlet. Uh, in case when the flowlet will start, it can quickly be zoomed to a particular position uh, by, us by using the, 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 the data in the index. Oops. So let me give you an example of how does it look. For example, in this case, you have a stream called pool, right? Uh, which is the stream we use for the whole world. <laughs> uh, so stream name is who. So underneath, there's a directory named 00001, which basically means generation equal ones. Uh, it has some serial paddings. Uh, it's just for like, if you visit, Visually, it will be like easier to see. It's not like it doesn't really carry any extra values because uh, in the program code, it always passes it as an integer. So it's just for like visual display if you LS it. And then underneath, this is the partition directory. So you can see that this partition, if you decode the timestamp, basically means the partition start time is this date. Uh, um, Actually, I, I admitted the time. The time is like zero, 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 like, uh, like midnight. Uh, the reason is because the partition duration is one day in here. So the timestamp, the partition timestamp is always aligned with uh, the partition duration stop. So basically, it's like divide by one day and one by one, one day again. So they run up to the beginning of the day, basically. Uh, so if it is if the duration is one hour, then it will be aligned to like an hour bar, uh, the, the hour bar. Can I ask you something? Yes? So what, where is the timestamp coming from? Uh, where? Is it the right to timestamp? It's the right to timestamp. It's so the right to timestamp. Right how do we deal with clock speed? So we have several methods. Mm -hmm. Like we've seen this in Dolby where one of their machines was like one, one hour off. So what will happen in that case? Is there a way to no, no. I mean, the assumption is that the server timestamp has to be more or less insane. Uh, it's not just for this case because not even HBase will work if the timestamp is good. No, not this has other problems. Like, for example, if we have a different system that is buffering and forwarding it, so if it holds it for, like, let's say, something happens goes wrong with it, it's buffering for a day, and if it sends an event, it's for the next day's event that it yeah. Well, the thing is because when you, if you do that, right, inside your event, you have to carry the, your own timestamp or sequence number information because there's no way for us to know what's inside data and there's no way for us to know how long you buffer the things. And we structure the stream in a way that is 
the performance is good enough so that you don't have to buffer on your side. You can keep writing to the screen, and that will give you like near, like close to the, the actual um, time that the event happens. But of course, there will be latency across the network and that kind of stuff. So the timestamp is the time that the that the writer see the event. But we should at least add something in the documentation to recommend that you know, we do XMPP checks and all this. Sure. That will be kind of part of the crystal setup. And actually, it is needed everywhere. Not just the stream, it's needed for HBase, it's needed for the transaction server, it's needed for everywhere. <laughs> okay, so finally, the, the founding part, right? Um, as I said, we can only have one writer to file, right? We cannot have multiple writers that write the same file. So that's why there's a file prefix. So in terms of the file name, there's a prefix to the writer, of the writer instance. And we actually don't use HFS append. Uh, according, according to Gary, it's not good. I mean, it's buggy and, and it's kind of like they, they may be removing it. So anyway, we are not using append. So the problem with not using append is that when a writer restarts, what will happen, right? It cannot write to the old file. So it has to write to a new file. So that's why there's a sequence number inside the file name and it is monotonically increasing. Uh, so that it, it makes sure like the same writer instance would always come up with like increasing uh, the sequence number. Uh, and so when a writer opens a file, open a, a, a file to write, it first finds the highest sequence number and then use uh, plus one to do it. And it doesn't have any race conditions because of the file prefix, right? So one writer instance only have like own that file prefix. And when it search for a high sequence number, it search with in that file prefix number. So this is how it looks like. Uh, so the file prefix in this case is file.0 and it means it's written by or created by the writer instance 0. Uh, so the instance ID is also the one that comes from the true instance ID as well, in case if you're uh, curious where does it come from. <coughs> and it is sequence, uh, sequence 0, which means basically it's the first file that ever created by this writer in these particular conditions. So if you, for example, at this point, let's say you restart reactor so that the writer can restart. Uh, then you'll see like file zero and zero 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 one uh, as the file name. And of course, DAT suffix means it's, a, it's an event file in this case. Okay. So next is how does the event file look like? Right. What's inside it? Um, and we have a custom event file format rather than using some known file format for a couple of reasons. One is, the major reason is because we want to support tail right, as format needed for, uh, for that case. So we need to control exactly what happened and exactly when to crush uh, into the files. Uh, so that on reader end, it can tail correctly. It knows like when an event has been fully flushed, when it is not, you know, things like that. And we don't want buffering, basically, right? A lot of file format they have actually have implicit buffering, and if you flush too frequent, then the file size will be very big, and that kind of stuff. So basically, they're not really designed for tail. So that's why we come up with a custom event file format. How does it look like? And then you can see, Hanging yeah. What is that? That's like hanging the file. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, besides tail, the other reason is we want to be able to skip efficiently uh, by the timestamp. Uh, because we know that the events in the file is always sorted by the timestamp. So the file is relatively simple. It contains a header part and a couple data and then followed by n data blocks. And then there's the tail, right? So simple. So what's inside the header? Header um, contains. So the first two bytes of the header <laughs> is always a what I call a magic code, which is kind of common across like 
in many file formats, you always have some like two bytes or four bytes. Uh, it shouldn't have index. <laughs> it's too long. <laughs> so E1 is basically mean event. It's four uh, bytes. <laughs> it means event version one. So potentially we can uh, evolve the, the uh, file format by using different versions um, so that we can have, like, based on the header, first two bytes, we can select different read and write to it. So, a read of thing. <coughs> and header followed by, so after the first two bytes, it follows by a properties. Uh, properties is basically a map from strength to strength that we can store any kind of stuff in it. Uh, so currently, we only store uh, some schema inside, that I'm going to talk about, but we're going to store uh, the schema of the events uh, inside so that we can support, like, schema evolution as well. For the uh, events, uh, for the events that we store in the data block. So next, what's inside data block? So each data block begins with an eight byte timestamp, which is a millisecond, uh, a long uh, timestamp. Uh, so <laughs> we start with that timestamp, followed by the block size. So the block size basically is the size of uh, not the whole block, but like basically starting from here till the end of the data block. Uh, so it's used for skipping. So for example, let's say you are reading a file and then you determine that this time that timestamp are not interesting. For example, for a map this case, it's outside of the time range that we want to process. Or when we are going to support TTL on stream, uh, it's actually past the TTL. So we want to skip everything inside this data block. Because everything inside this data block would have the same timestamp. Uh, so this is for that case. And after that, it's followed by n event. So inside each event, uh, it has it's basically the, the stream event data, which has header and the body. Uh, that's it. So the header is a map from string to string. The body is a byte array. So all the events in the in that block have the same time. Stamp. Have the same timestamp. Yes. So the timestamp is not stored uh, repeatedly. Uh, so that when we decode, we actually take the timestamp and we construct multiple events with the same timestamp. The reason for that is, uh, I'll explain a little bit later, but it's because the way that the writer is being written for the high throughput. So you can treat it like this block is being written in one buffer, uh, buffered write, if it has like high, uh, high concurrency of write. Mm -hmm. It's milliseconds. So the same for each data block. Then the tail is really simple. It's just eight by timestamp equal to negative one. So it signals the, that's the end of the file. So nothing, uh, nothing more goes beyond this point, right? So the reader, if the reader sees this, then it knows, okay, this file is done. I can close this one and open the next one. If there's the file, next file. Uh, of course, you may ask, okay, what happened? Crash, and you know, look, I'll cover that. <laughs> So the, uh, both the properties and the event are uh, Afro-binary serialized. Uh, right now, there's no compression, so it's just serialized uh, without compression. Uh, and uh, as I said, the event schema uh, is stored in, inside the properties as well. OK, now let's go a little bit deeper. Yes. So uh, this means that whatever uh, data gets in the stream, only the app application can be. Do we provide any tools? So, so we do have a stream input format class that knows how to read the stream files, right? That basically gives you a uh, timestamp and a timestamp as the key because it's an input format. So it's a, it's a standard Hadoop input format. So it gives you a timestamp and then the stream event. As the value. So we do have that. Uh, right now it's not really open source, uh, but we do have a format, uh, input format. And in fact, we use it inside the MapReduce uh, run that we have so that uh, to support MapReduce to be able to consume stream data. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about writer uh, in specific performance. Right? So when we talk about performance, we always talk about two things, right? One is the latency, the other is the throughput. So first of all, latency. Right? So latency is very important because that's basically the speed that gets perceived by a single cloud, 
right? Because the client sends something to the uh, post something to a stream endpoint, uh, and then after a while he receives a response, right? That's basically the latency seen by the client. Uh, and of course, the lower the better, right? The faster the better, because if the client only have one client, right? Then if you have a really huge latency, then you cannot do a lot, right? But if you have short latency, you can do a lot. What is it? A lot more, right? And since the screen endpoint uh, guarantees there's no data loss, which means whenever the HTTP call with return 200, uh, it's guaranteed that the data has been written to a physical storage uh, in a replicated manner as well. So, which means the Theoretically, the minimum latency we can have is the file sync time. Right? You cannot go faster than that. Uh, I mean, the, the HFS file sync time or the local file sync time, whatever it is. Uh, so that's the minimum we, we can get. Right? That's the best. Okay. Oh, that's latency. Right? Basically, the user is waiting. And throughput. What is throughput? Throughput basically is the flow rate, right? How fast the data can, like how many data you can throw through within a, a unit amount of time. And of course, the higher the, higher, the better. Um, and we all know that if you buffer more events, you can have better throughput, right? Because if you write one event and then do a same, you write one event and do a same. Uh, and because file writer, you cannot have multiple threads that write to the same writer, right? You, you have to serialize all the writes. So if you don't buffer, then the best you can do is like basically the latency, like one second divided by the latency, right? Uh, but if you buffer, then you do one sync per n events, right? That would be much faster. But of course, if we always buffer, the problem is you will have higher latency, right? Because a client sends some data, let's say he's the first one. He kind of has to wait for more client to send more data so that the buffer is up or some kind of timeout is reached. Then the data will get sent before he get, he get the response. Right? So if we want to buffer more, it's kind of like the latency will be high. It's kind of a trade-off. Um, and the idea behind the, the screenwriter is that we try to maintain low latency when the uh, Number of clients, number of concurrency is kind of low. For example, if you have one client, you should get the latency that you get should be around the same as the file sync time plus network latency, right? Uh, but if you have high concurrent number of clients, uh, the writer should be able to leverage that so that it can buffer something without sacrificing latency, because the number of concurrent requests is high enough, right? Then you don't have to wait for buffer. The buffer is kind of always full, in, in some sense, right? So how do we do that? So let's take a look what's inside the writer. So inside the writer, of course, we have script writer and HFS. It's very simple, right? There's a NetHDB uh, server, and then inside there are multiple uh, handler, stream handler, so each of them will run in one thread. Um, uh, basically, that's the worker thread of the netting. But then they have to share one file writer instance, right? Because the one file writer basically corresponds to one physical file. Right? And you don't want one thread write to, write to one file. There will be too many files. <laughs> because you can have like 200 threads. You don't want to write 20 files. So the single instance of file writer, and of course that one write to HFS. So can you tell me, so what's the problem with that? Right? So it's very simple, right? You have multiple threads, you have a single instance, which means you need some kind of synchronization or coordination across this thread so that at one time you only have one thread trying to use the file writer and write it things through it and do the same, you know, that kind of stuff. All the IO operations has to be done by one track. So a very simple strategy would be using a lock. Right? So everyone try to fight for a writer lock. Uh, the one who wins will write everything 
in the in, mem, uh, in a shared buffered uh, in the file and I do a set. But that would be pretty slow. Um, the reason is, as I said, we could have like high number of concurrent threads, right? Which means the number of threads on the server side cannot be too small. It will be around something like like hundreds, or it depends on how many cores you have, but it will be like quite a lot. Uh, so that if you use a lock, the contention for the lock will be really, really high. Uh, in fact, I wrote an experimental version that uses a lock, and that, that's very, very slow. Like, like it, if you have a high number of concurrent clients, all you can get is like a couple hundred uh, events per second uh, for the write because of the contention. So, how do you synchronize access to the file write? Inside the uh, Spring implementation, there's a class called Concurrent Spring Writer. Uh, internally, the core <laughs> algorithm looks like this. So, as the name suggests, it's concurrent. So, there's no lock involved. So, algorithm looks like this. Basically, when a thread, when a handler thread receives an event, it simply enqueues it to a concurrent queue. It's a non blocking queue, so it just appends to the end of the queue. That's very simple, right? So remember, okay, so um, remember one thing is currently our endpoints only support one event at a time. We don't support batch events, right? So this is, keep, keep, it, keep that in mind. So when you receive an event, it simply just enqueue um, that event in the concurrent queue. <coughs> Step two, we use a compare and swap, the cats. Compare and swap to try to set an atomic boolean to true. So the atomic boolean initial is false, right? So you try to set it to true. If successfully set to true, which means that particular threat is the winner, and we proceed to further steps, the losers will go to the other steps. Okay. So step four, which is part of the winner step. So the winner will dequeue, will keep dequeuing events from the concurrent queue, and keep writing to the files until the queue is empty. Okay. And it's guaranteed that the queue would be empty at some point because you only have like n threads, right? So maximum there will be n events only. You cannot go beyond that. So you keep basically draining the, the whole queue and keep writing to files, not doing any setting. So basically write to file this part uh, is a combination of writing into some in-memory buffer uh, and uh, to local files that uh, the HFS is being structured. So you know how the you know, HFS when you write to HFS uh, DFS output stream, you have to write to some local files before it gets shipped to, like it has to accumulate to a certain size before it's shipped to the, the actual data node. But anyway, so it involves like writing some in-memory buffer plus to some local files as being uh, uh, governed by the uh, HFS output stream. So step five, after the queue is drained, it performs one file sync. Uh, to persist all the data being written, to make sure all the data being written in stack force being persist. So you can see that this two step is basically the buffering and like the buffering and the set, right? But it's not end yet. Next, it has to so after the set, it has to set the state of all the events that it decodes in stack four to completed, right? So meaning stack events all these events has been like correctly persist. Or actually the complete can be fail as well uh, if the step five fails. But anyway, it, it basically make it market as completed. Step seven, which is very important, it set the atomic boolean back to false. Right? It seems obvious, but actually this step is very important. Because this one triggered a happening before relations uh, in, in the Java, me Java memory models. So once step seven is being executed, it's guaranteed that all other threads will see the state that are being set in step six. Okay? So in here the state, there's no synchronization. There's not, it's not even volatile, it's just a simple variable. So it depends on, so it might leak to other threads earlier, but the step seven guarantee that all other threads will see the changes. Step eight. Uh, which is part of the loser step as well. So remember in step three, we have a loser. It's part of the loser step, uh, step as well. 
So if the event owned by this thread, which means the event that you execute in the first step, that event is not yet completed, go back to step two. So it's a loop. Go back to step two and try to find an event and try to find for the right turn thread again. Okay? So you see there's no lock inside, there's no synchronization. Uh, the only synchronization for synchronization related thing we have is the atomic boolean. And that's it. Okay? So is it correct? Yes. I think it's probably correct, but it's just the threads that are waiting there basically spinning. It's a spring, it's a spin, yes. If you have so threads that's why in step A, before I go back to step 2, it called a thread.u. So what is thread.u? We could sleep. We could sleep. But sleep actually is like slower. So what is thread.u? According to Java is basically the smallest amount of time that the thread suspend so that it gives the, uh, like basically give up the CPU core for, to some other threads. Uh, so if you replace, so I try to replace this one with nanosecond sleep 1, for example. The performance is about like 80% of using you. I mean the, the throughput and the limit. So um, yeah, so that it needs a fact of you. That's, that's a very good point. <laughs> okay? Yes. Why not spend like one thread for like DQ another thing? So if you have one thread for DQ, how do we do it? So basically that thread. Uh, rather using a concurrent queue, we'll be, we'll be using a broken queue because we have to wait until something comes. A broken queue involves a synchronization. It basically the same as using block, almost, but there will be less content contention, but it will be slower than this one. Well, actually, there's still a lot of contention because we have to get it right. Current queue, right? Uh, well, then yeah, that thread has to keep pulling. Yeah, yeah, that one has to keep pulling them, which means if there's no event, you still occupy kind of very full all the time. Yeah. But with this, if there's no event or very low rate of events, you don't use that medicine. Yeah, so correctness, it's very important, right? <laughs> so we have to guarantee that there's no losing events. Uh, the reason why it's correct is because the winner always trains the queue, which means because the the winner thread is also the one like enqueued earlier, right? So which means the events that it enqueued will always get enqueued by this winner as well. So that particular event should get written and persist in step five. For the losers, there are two possible cases happen, right? One is the current leader, the, the winner, starts drains after the enqueue uh, being done by this loser. Then that's fine because the winner will guarantee that you get uh, Persist. Or otherwise, because it will loop and retry, right? Then, because it's loop and retry, then it either become a winner, which go back to this case, or other winners will drain. If other winners will drain, it go back to this case as well. Right? So it's kind of guaranteed that it will always complete, it will always guarantee that the data will get persist. Uh, and this gives us a really, really good throughput. Uh, we talk about like, if you have low number of concurrent time, the latency is pretty good because you don't buffer, you don't wait, you just keep writing. Uh, uh, so latency is kind of close to the network latency plus the uh, HFS sync latency. Uh, when you have high concurrent number of uh, uh, crime, the latency will be increased a little bit because of the loop uh, to wait for the winner to drain. So that might take a little bit longer. But the throughput is really high. It's talking about like close to 20k per second uh, events that get written. Is that the case of starvation? The loser always loses. Then we stop. The, the losers will not always lose. If he cannot get the flag, flag. Well, the, the thing is, it will exit if its own event is being completed in step 8. If the event owned by this thread is not complete, then it will go to step 2. Otherwise, it will, it will exit, right? Because it is, it is done. So even if you lose, if the event is done, it doesn't matter because that request is done. Right. So it doesn't have to be wait until we become winner. It doesn't. All it is waiting for is to wait for the events that it enqueued in step one is being completed. Right. So uh, I don't have time to do like really good comparison between like 
to other systems because recently Kafka actually they published a performance uh, report claiming that they can perform two million events right per second. Uh, but actually that is using async write, which means it's not guaranteed that the data is being persist when the publisher uh, get a response from so. Second is batched. Uh, so they're writing like, I don't know, per kind they're writing something like 100 events rather than one event at a time. So imagine that, because we write only one event, Imagine that if we add an endpoint that supports batch events and you write 100 events, right? Currently we can do 20k multiply, multiply by 100, that would be 2 million, right? So, and we are writing the right? and it is guaranteed to be persist while Kafka is not. So, we, we kind of at that level of performance. So, uh, maybe over a little bit if you guys don't mind because this is just the writer side. <laughs> we still have the consumer part. Uh, but lucky that the consumer part is faster because I don't have too much time to prepare the slides. So, uh, I'll go through those slightly faster. <laughs> uh, so, scalability. Uh, so, since one file to writer process. So, and there's no complications across writers. So, it's almost basically linearly scaled by adding more writers. Uh, write, a, write a instance. Uh, there will be, of course, there will be a, a barn that basically is the barn of the IO of the whole cluster, uh, and also it depends on how we create the Spring Writer instance that Node <laughs> is working on as well. Uh, but but in theory, it's basically a linear scale right? for the writer. Okay, now we finally goes into the read side. Uh, so for the map reduce reading, it's not very exciting because so I'm not going to talk about that because it's just a bunch of HFS files which has a stream input format that the map reduce can consume. So there's nothing special about that. But to tail the stream is something very special. So first of all, this is a very simple picture on what to mean by tail. So as I said, you have multiple writers that write to multiple files, right? And all of them, right now we don't do any petition uh, besides time petition, right? We don't do secondary uh, petition. Uh, potentially we, we might be supporting that, but right now we don't. So basically the reader is a multi-file reader that reads from these files like simultaneously and do a, uh, using a priority queue to, to, to merge. It's like merge sort uh, across this file. And then to produce one, uh, one single screen to the consumer. Uh, but uh, one thing is this the ordering of the timestamp, event, uh, the events timestamp, is not strictly guaranteed. Right? The reason is because if you have really, really high rate of writing to the screen, they, they might, like, based on the time that it gets saying and being available from the data drop, right? So you might have a timestamp later in this file, in the first file, but being available for the reader before the, in an early timestamp uh, from the second file that can be read from by the reader. So that it slightly depends on by the time of merging, the events might get shuffled a little bit because of that. Um, but that is kind of the same as the old stream as well. Uh, uh, it depends on the, uh, because of the implementation. Um, so if we really want to do like script ordering, um, I know there will be some delay between the read uh, because you have to buffer up to like I don't know ten milliseconds. You for sure that you don't see it, uh, or uh, fifteen milliseconds depends on the latency. Right? We have to do some procrastination on the buffering uh, if we really want to provide like strict ordering of the timestamp. But right now we don't. So, tailing HFS file. This is specific for the HFS file, not for the local file mode, but uh, they are implemented with the same reader, so they kind of operate it in the same way. HFS files doesn't really support tail. Okay, so basically, you cannot open an input stream and then have another process open an output stream, and this one keep writing, this one can keep reading. You cannot. 
right? In local file, you can, actually, but in HFSL, you cannot. You cannot in the way that uh, you will get end of file exceptions when you try to read from an HFS file that is not yet closed but doesn't have like more data. So you'll get an exception, rather you get blocks or rather you get zero bytes being read. Uh, so the strategy is pretty simple. Uh, every time there's an end of file exceptions, the reader will reopen the uh, input screen uh, until it sees the, the ending timestamp, uh, the tail part, which is negative one timestamp. Then it knows that that's the end of file. It won't try to uh, reopen the file again. Uh, so this is how we tail in general. But there's a case that the writer crash. So what happens if the writer crash? When writer crash, there's no negative one minus one timestamp being written at the end of the file, right? But when the writer crash, we assume that it will restart at some time in the future, right? After it crash. As I said, the, because of the file format or the, the file naming convention, the writer will always try to create a new file to write. And the new file is either with a new sequence ID or in a new partition, depending on when the sequence is written. So that's why the reader also regularly looks for new files um, on the JFS system. It only looks for that if there's no events being read from the current uh, reader stream that it opened. Because if there's like data being read, then it doesn't bother whether there's a new file yet or not. Because eventually it will hit the end, then it will open a new file. Uh, so if no event read, it will look for files with the next sequence. Uh, and also based on the current uh, time, it will uh, also try to find the new file in the new partition as well, because it knows when it will have a new files based on the partition after a few seconds. So this is how the uh, so this is currently how the reader handle like write the crash. We could potentially do it better on on this two part by rather than like we have to regularly look for new files, uh, we can leverage uh, like Zookeeper as a channel to like propagate some events that when writers has create new file. Right. So right now we have another question. If the writer doesn't crash, then it's simply idle because no event is right. But now there's a reader that mm -hmm. wants to tail. Mm -hmm. Maybe even multiple readers. Right? Mm -hmm. So they all will keep reopening the yes. file, Currently, yes. keep checking for a new file. Yes. Does that like, put a lot of load on, on so, the table, So that's kind of the only way we can do it right now uh, uh, and so that's why there's a back off in the in the flowlet that if there's no event then it will like back off up to like two seconds uh, which means like it will wait for two seconds before it pull again something like that uh, so yes there's a back off strategy in there uh, because that's kind of the only way to tell the HFS file for now uh, maybe in the future they will have better support but that's kind of the only way. <coughs> We'll, we'll see, we'll, we'll do some more load tests on, mm -hmm. on the load on the main code. Yes? Uh, when the writer restarts, it can also write minus one to the last sequence. No, it cannot be open the files because it crashed, right? So it crashed, it kind of lost the control on the old files, right? It, it cannot, because if you open the old file again, then it's an append, right? <laughs> and also, you don't know when or where you crash. You may be crashed at the middle of the data block. Then writing a negative one is not valid, right? I mean, the reader won't recognize it. You will see, okay, uh, the data block says you have 100 bytes. I can only read 50 bytes, and then I got end of file exceptions, right? If you write a negative one, then it doesn't help. So that's why it, it cannot. Okay, uh, it's a, a jumping a little bit. <laughs> so. Uh, the, the file reader actually supports some local filtering as well. Uh, so currently, the, uh, the only filter that we support right now is these two type of filter. Uh, the first one is by event timestamp. So if you filter by event timestamp, basically it can skip the whole data block uh, at a time. 
So it is useful, for example, TTL implementation, right? So if the writer sees, okay, this data, this time time actually passed the TTL, it just skip the whole block rather than have to read it and like decode and you know things like that. And skipping is really really fast uh, because it's just a seek uh, on the JFS. Uh, and the second part is the skip by file offset. So skip by file offset is basically means on every event that the reader that the reader read before it actually decode the event, it has a file offset, right? It knows where that event starts, and then uh, the filter can determine whether I want to accept this event or not by looking at the file offset. And currently, it is used by the round robin consumer. Uh, because the round robin consumer basically use the file offset as the hash key to determine whether this particular a particular consumer instance will consume that uh, event or not. Uh, so you, you know what is round robin consumer? Yes, right. In the flowlet, in the flowlet, when you write to a process method, you can annotate it with at round robin. Right? That means it is using round robin uh, consumer. If you have multiple instances, then Let's say you have two instances, right? Then one of the instances will like skip and fix by using this because it knows that the other instance will process it. This is the only two uh, filters that we support. Uh, down the road, we might add like filter by the event header as well uh, when we support hash partitioning on stream event. Uh, right now, we, we don't really support that, but when we support it, we'll add that. So, in fact, you can see that uh, the, if, the efficiency in skipping is kind of increasing because this one is the, the fastest because it doesn't even need, need to look at the data block. This one needs to go into the data block. If we add the filter by stream header, then you need to decode at least the stream header uh, before you can skip. I have a question about the wrong problem. So, if you use the file offset, mm -hmm. and then you do like the module, the number of sequence. Of it's not it's real, real round, round, right? round, round is because if all my events say you have size 10, then they'll all be multiples of 10. Uh, yeah, but it's used a, a, a different hash function. It's not just using a file offset, it uses a hash function to compute. Okay. So it tries to randomize it a little bit. But it's not truly round robin. Mm -hmm. uh, due to the fact that it, it cannot be efficiently implemented. If it's a tail, because you don't know, there, there's no like starting point for you to start round robin. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's the reason, and, and this is actually the same, kind of the same as the O stream implementation. The O stream implementation used the uh, kind of the row key uh, of the table as the hash, and, and use it as, as a hash, uh, come to a hash value. Okay. Okay. Next uh, is the consumer state. So consumer. So remember. So when I talk about consumer, it's basically flow. Basically means flowlet in this case, right? So the consumer state. Uh, we we need that because in flowlet we guarantee exactly what's processing, right? Um, so even the consumer crash. Right? If you have processed something, if you have processed one stream event, and you commit that processing, right? Then it's guaranteed that even you crash and restart, it will not get reprocessed, right? So we need to persist the state. So during the, the, the consumptions of the events, uh, the states are being persist to either space or level DB. Uh, the states are written transactionally. Uh, the key of, so it's, it's, a, it's an x ray state, right? So the key uh, to the state is basically for each event, it has the generation number, a encoder representation of the file name, which contains like partitions and file prefix and things like that, plus the file offset. This is the key. And the value will carry the right pointer, which means the one who process and commits this entry, uh, the instance ID and the state. So the state will simply just say processed uh, in, uh, if it's like completely processed. If it's not processed uh, of, or if the process is failed, then there's no state being returned. Uh, so given that, uh, how many IOs that the consumer will do during the queue? 
So each decal from the string, let's say the batch size is n, whatever that batch size is. Uh, for the run, so there are two cases, right? For the run robin case, or for the FIFO case, that we only have one instance. Okay. Uh, it first roughly do n multiplied by number of uh, instances, number of consumer instances, widths or skips, combinations of widths and skips uh, from the file readers. Uh, so if you have like two instances of round robin, for example, it will do two n of widths, but then the widths actually have skipped inside because of the use of the file filter. Uh, plus a batch write of n rows to each base on commit. Okay, so when you, you dequeue, right, you dequeue something, and then you call a uh, uh, forward process method to process it, and then the, the method returns successfully, and then you do a commit, stand on the commit, do the write to the next base. Uh, of course, uh, there would be like rollback, and then you have to delete the rows if it is like a uh, commit failed, you know, whatever that is, if there's conflict, things like that. But in, in, in normal case, um, in optimistic case, because we're using optimistic concurrency control, in optimistic case, that the number of IOs uh, for this type of consumer, round robin or five fold size number one, uh, size equal one. But for five fold of size greater than two, greater than or equal to two, uh, it could be pretty slow. That's why we don't. We always say it's just a round robin for, for the screen. Uh, so it still do roughly around n multiplied by size of widths or skips. Uh, well, actually, in this case, there's no skip at all. It cannot skip. So uh, there's no skip. It's only widths. Um, well, actually, uh, yeah, it's only skip. Uh, only widths. And then it has to do n. I, I don't know, the upper bound would be the n multiplied by size, which basically for each imbalance of width, it tries to do a check and put in your edge base, which is basically fighting for that entry, to, to claim that entry. So the check and put your edge base is basically writing a claim state to the state table, as I mentioned earlier. So if that operation is successful, then that particular instance of consumer own that win and own that entry and will process that entry. And the other one will lose and go on to the next one and so on and so forth. So you can imagine that with a lot of Right, uh, to each base because of that. Is it like batch checking food? Hmm? Any batch checking food? Uh, we actually talk about. No, checking food kind of batch. You know? I don't think each base APIs are called batch checking food. As I remember. I'm confused. You don't think so? Maybe that would be a good call for Yeah. I think. I think the, the, the raw edge base kind doesn't support uh, batch check and yeah. If you use Kubernetes, then you can do it on server side of the loop. But why not? It doesn't. And of course, at the end, when the commit is still batch writes n rows to edge base on roughly around n rows, right? It depends on how many how many entries it means in, in these steps, right? Uh, uh, n rows to so that's why you see like if you're using run or like five fold, but you only have one instance, then the the number of writes to each base is like kind of the minimum you can get already. <laughs> uh, but if with five fold, then there will be a performance hit. Uh, in fact, with the not with spring, but with kill, with uh, full rack kill, we did some performance tests before uh, for five fold. Uh, the performance kind of top at like you have three number uh, number of instances equal to three. After that, then the performance will start degrading because of the steps, because of the contention of the steps. Okay, next is is almost done. <laughs> so next <laughs> is the uh, consumer state store. So per consumer instance, we also have another table that maintain the state of that particular consumer instance. So what do you mean by state of a consumer instance? It's basically a list of file offsets. Uh, because as I said, the consumer is actually reading from multiple files. Right? So each file has different offsets uh, based on where does it go, uh, like how far does it read. Uh, so they basically a list of file and offset. 
and it is guaranteed that the events before these offsets are all processed, are all committed and processed, perceived by this instance. Okay? The reason is, think about round robin case, as I said, right? The round robin case will skip uh, record. Uh, and we know that, so for a particular round robin instance, a consumer instance, it knows that whatever it skips will get processed by some other instance. Okay, so that it, it can for sure know, like it can, it can uh, advance the state based on that. But you might ask, so what happens if the number of instances change? Then that requires reconfiguration, uh, which I'm going to talk about in the next slide. Uh, but basically, the state of a consumer instance uh, helps it to resume from last good offset. For example, if you like toss as resume or stop and start or maybe that instance crash and then you have to restart it rather than scanning from the very beginning and check against HBase to see whether that's been processed or not uh, it has some good state to resume from uh, and the state is persists periodically in the post commit hook so that will add uh, one extra write to HBase like periodically but not on every commit and also on close so I talk about reconfiguration. That, that's that's the last two slides. <laughs> so I talk about consumer uh, reconfiguration. So reconfiguration is needed if you change uh, the number of focus instances, right? Let's say you only have two uh, instances for doing round robin. Right? Now you change it to three. So because as I, as Andreas mentioned, right, it's basically taking a model of the number of instances. If you change it to three. The assignment would be like all different because of that, right? So that every consumer, when they resume, they have to resume from some earlier state rather than the, the, the later state of its own uh, as being persisted before. So the, the reconfiguration basically uh, will find the smallest offset across all consumer states and use that as the starting point for all the consumer instances when they resume. Because that guarantees that nothing will be missed because of that. Okay? Um, and actually, I, I skipped some details in here because uh, when a consumer starts the first time, it actually has to perform some extra read uh, to HBase because it might see events that are already processed uh, up to a certain point. So there's a, that's one of the most complicated parts inside the screen consumer implementation. Uh, to make it like perform, but yet correct. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, so that will make sure no events left behind. Okay, so that's the last last one. Uh, the last part is the truncation, which I added recently. Uh, that will be after 2.2. So in 2.2, there's no support for truncation. So why it worth mentioning? So think about how truncation is done. So how do truncate? Simply, so in the old days, when we use HBase, truncate basically means just truncate the table, right? I mean, disable the table, drop everything, and then go to the table, uh, be quick, like drop the table, be the table with the same uh, parameters. But with file, you cannot do that easily because you have writer that are open to a particular files. You have readers that have the reader open to those particular files as well. So for truncate, you cannot just delete those files. Right? You, you run into some unknown state. <laughs> and if you delete those files, then you don't know exactly what will happen. And, and after you truncate, if there are like, writes happening, then they might be still.